adelante. Ok, uh, we are going to start now. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So, hi everybody, thank you for being here to the weekly colloquium. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Rin van der Weyhardt. Professor Rin van der Weyhardt obtained his PhD, cum laude, in 1991 at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Subsequently, he worked as a fellow at the Canadian Institute of, for Astrophysics in Canada and later as a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Germany before taking a Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences fellowship at the Captain Astronomical Institute at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Since 2004, he is professor of cosmological structure formation at the Captain Astronomical Institute. Uh, his research interests concern cosmology, the formation and evolution of the large scale structure of the universe, as well as computational geometry, topology, and pattern recognition. He is a pioneer in the study of the cosmic web using modern computational and mathematical techniques. Uh, within his research interests, he has particular interest in the formation and dynamics of the cosmic web and the existence and evolution of, cos of cosmic voids. For the analysis of this structure, he has developed novel tools based on the Voronoi and Delonic tessellations and related geometry and topological concepts. And he is considered an authority and reference in these subjects. Aside from these cosmological concepts, he is also interested in the history of astronomy, in particular, a project on the world's, world's oldest astronomical and mechanical computer, the Antikythera Mechanisms, from ancient Hellenistic times, where he is also considered a world expert. Uh, actually, he, he could come one day and give us a talk about this. This is a fascinating subject. And finally, I would like to mention that he was also my PSD advisor, and it was a real honor and a pleasure working with him. Um, Maureen is going to talk uh, about the cosmic world in the local universe, dynamics, and reconstruction. Uh, thank you very much, Rin, for being here. Uh, okay. I leave you. Okay. Um, well, let me first uh, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And um, it's, it's a great honor to be able to talk to you and be able to talk to two institutes at the same time. Uh, UNAM in Mexico City and uh, in Ensenada. I visited uh, UNAM Mexico, uh, I think half a year uh, before the Corona crisis started to happen and uh, met uh, various of uh, people of you. And it's a pleasure to see that you are here again. I also see my old friend from Cita days, uh, Luc is also here, so that's fun. But most of all, I'm, um, very honored that Miguel uh, invited me. He mentioned it as uh, one of the last issues in the introduction, but of course, uh, Miguel has played a large role in a lot of the work that I will describe this evening. He has uh, always been one of the most original PhD students at the University of Groningen at the Kaptein Institute. Um, and I hope that also in the run of this talk, you will be able to see some of uh, the major contributions that he has given to um, uh, the topic. So let me first share um, the uh, presentation. I hope you can see it. Um, in case not, please warn me. So what I want okay. to talk about is the cosmic web. And the cosmic web, um, to some extent, without exaggeration, we can say is the largest structure in the universe. Um, that is the largest structure that emerged from the primordial circumstances uh, that were uh, imprinted in the early universe. It's the first manifestation of gravitational evolution. So I will first start with introducing some of the typical properties and characteristics of the cosmic web, uh, because we need to understand these properties to put into place some of the things that we subsequently do in uh, analyzing these. Um, one part of the analysis will concern a reconstruction of the cosmic web in the local universe, so that you sort of get a feel of the reality and the structure in which we live. Subsequently, I will be presenting some of the more recent work in which we have been looking at the tidal forces, the strains, as well as the forces in the cosmic web, because in the end, the cosmic web is formed by the forces that the gravitational forces 
that have been shaping it since the past 13.8 billion years of cosmic evolution. So let me first start with a um, what I would say a, a, a model. Let me see whether it, uh, a, a model calculation, a large computer simulation, a supercomputer simulation of the cosmic web, in particular of the dark matter distribution in the cosmic web, the stuff that we can't see, but the stuff that gravitationally um, dominates the formation of structure in the universe. It's a, a supercomputer sim uh, uh, simulation that was run by uh, CosmoGrid that was run on three supercomputers over the world, one in the US, one in Japan, and one in Amsterdam. And what I show here is basically a CT scan. So what you see is the structure of the cosmic web at the current cosmic epoch after 13.8 billion years. And what, what we will do is we start with a slice through this structure um, at the bottom of the computational box. And subsequently, we walk through the box in the Z direction, in the vertical direction, and we go slice by slice by slice. It's like a CT scan of the human body, but then of the cosmic web. And why do we do this? Because in this way, you do get an impression of the structural complexity of the cosmic web you will see that there are large regions that are under dense, empty, or no, not completely empty. We call them voids. They dominate in terms of volume. What you also will see is large structures that basically um, uh, run from throughout the box. They are large filaments or large walls, dependent on whether they run through several slices or not. So elongated strings, uh, filaments, or uh, flattened walls. And you will see that all of these things connect in a network. And the network has basically nodes at which walls and filaments group together. And they are sort of the nodal points of this network. So you see the various structures morphological structures. But the other important thing, and that's part of the CT scan inventory, is that you see that they do not, these structures do not have a particular scale. You see ones that are running through the entire box of 30 megaparsec side, and some of them are extremely small. The whole spectrum of sizes, and that makes the complexity of the structure even larger. So it's a multi-scale structure. Um, and so the best thing to do is use your three-dimensional imagination as we will be walking through this box and see how originally small voids basically seem to become larger and then close up again, or the other way around. And you see how the various structures connect throughout this box. And that structure already gives you an impression of the complexity of the structure that we have to describe, right? So structures of all kinds of sizes, you see large under dense regions and you see that the large under dense regions themselves are filled with small filaments, small walls that encompass even smaller voids. And basically you have a whole spectrum of these. But some of these large regions like what you see at the moment almost fill the entire box, right? So you see structures on all kinds of scales, but overall, the main structure that you see in terms of the density of the dark matter are these elongated filaments. It's all very stringy, right? That's the main characteristic of the cosmic web. And we will be paying attention to what is causing these structures and which of these structures dominate in terms of the force play in the um, uh, in the universe now to get to give you a a more um, um, you know uh, tacit impression of the cosmic web here you see an analysis of the same kind of cosmic web 
with a analysis classification tool, which we call MMF Nexus, where uh, basically you see in blue the filaments in a thick slice through such a simulation. And what do you see? You see big main arteries, and you see that to these arteries branching off a whole spectrum of smaller filamentary structures. In a sense, it very much resembles the system of veins or blood vessels in your body. In fact, the technique that has been applied here emanates from medical research. And I once showed this picture uh, at the University Hospital here in Groningen. They had invited me for a conference, a, a multidisciplinary conference. And the medical doctor said, oh, you know, that, that's blood vessels. That's how it looks like. It's not a coincidence that this is coming, that the, the resemblance to uh, blood vessels and uh, this classification scheme coming, uh, have bearing resemblance to the medical world is not a coincidence. It's actually borrowed from medical research. And the one person who's responsible for this is one of your own professors, it's Miguel. He found a long time ago, while he was a PhD student in Groningen, he found that in medical research, there was a tool which he called multi-scale morphology filter that we could apply to the distribution of galaxies in the universe. And he developed the, what he called MMF, uh, multi-scale morphology filter. This was one of the main things he did for his thesis. And um, in subsequent years, this was, you know, um, uh, developed further and further. And another PhD student, Marius Cotin, uh, developed this a bit further. Um, I will describe basically how this goes. But, you know, the resemblance to medical imaging is not a coincidence. So here you see cross-disciplinary research at its best. But, you know, at the same time, you see that in these images, and this is simulations, um, you see that this cosmic web-like structure is indeed very complex. So that means challenges for its study. Now you would say, yes, I believe you, you get out this out of a simulation, but you know, like regularly with simulations, what you put in, you get out. So what about reality? Now in the reality, there is this similar structure. And of course, what we try to do is to see whether the structure that you observe in, for example, the distribution of galaxies or the distribution of gas, whether you can compare that to the structure that you observe uh, in the simulation. So what you would like to do is to learn on the basis of the observations, what the repercussions are in terms of the underlying cosmology, uh, the elements, the, you know, how much gas, uh, the, 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 the prescriptions for the formation of galaxies, and all of these kind of things, the interplay between simulation theory and um, observations. And, you know, a, a probe like a complex structure like this is, of course, extremely helpful because the amount of information here is huge. So what you see here is a slice through one of the largest surveys, still the largest survey um, uh, of galaxies uh, in the universe, in the local universe. And every blue dot that you see over there is a galaxy. Starting from the tip, which is ourselves, you look out into the universe and along the radial distance, you basically see the distance with respect to our Milky Way. So when you then plot the locations of these galaxies, you indeed get a similar web-like network as you just saw in these simulations. So it does exist in reality. Now this is the local universe, but in the meantime, we have learned you can see all of these things as far as we probe into the visible universe. 
So for example, if you take a galaxy survey that doesn't take a large fraction of the sky, but limits itself to a much smaller part of the sky, but then pierces right up to a redshift of even beyond one, so extremely deep into the universe, you get an image like these two slices from the Vipers survey led by Luigi Guzzo. And you clearly see with the blue dots being the galaxies, you see that as far as you look out into the universe, you see a web-like network that very much resembles that theoretical simulation model, right? So indeed, the reality is very much like what we see in these simulations, at least superficially seen. Of course, the task is, can you actually distill characteristics of this web, of this observed cosmic web, to tune your underlying theory? Now, in the meantime, over the past decade and more, our tools for using the observations in uh, of the galaxy distributions have become far, far more sophisticated than anything that we had before. For example, there is this impressive work. This is work by Francesco Kitara. It's now already um, quite some years ago that he did this. But what the game here is, is that you look out into the sky, you map the distribution of galaxies. It's a discrete distribution of points. And then you say, well, I know that the distribution of galaxies is the result of gravitational evolution from some primordial conditions. And we know that these primordial conditions fulfilled a statistical prescription, Gaussian uh, random fields with a certain power spectrum, given this, and given our understanding of the galaxy formation um, process, and of course that needs to be tuned all the time, can I then constrain the initial conditions that prevailed in the same local volume of the universe that you observed? And you can by a very sophisticated machinery of Bayesian inference. It needs a lot of computations to be able to do that. But in fact, you can sort of put constraints on the initial conditions that prevailed in our local universe and then study what, as a result, the implied dark matter distribution is. And you see that when you do that, and so this is really the implied distribution of dark matter at the current time in the local universe on when you look around. So the egg-like shape is an idle projection of the cosmic web all around us, with us in the center. And you see how intricate this cosmic web is. I get back to this reconstruction in a moment when we um, apply it in a given model. And I, I will give you a tour through the local universe based on this. So you have to imagine that not only have we managed to map the local galaxy distribution, we even managed to infer the initial conditions that were underlying this and the implied dark matter cosmic web in our local universe. And of course, it's wonderful to have this because now you can compare the dark matter distribution with the implied galaxy distribution with the gas distribution and learn all kinds of um, ast uh, about astrophysical processes that have been playing a role. So to show you that the cosmic web is not only dark matter, although that's the dominant part, not only galaxies that I show here, but of course, in this web-like structure that has been uh, put there as a skeleton by the dark matter, the gas has been falling in. 
And of course, inside the gas, that's where basically in the end, the galaxies fall. But you may ask yourself, can I say something about the intergalactic medium? That's where most of the gas, most of the atoms in our universe are. Can I actually see them? So not just the galaxies, but also the gas. And also there has been tremendous developments over the past few years. People have been mapping the distribution of neutral hydrogen clouds in the cosmic web, in the filaments, by means of quasar absorption lines, the Lyman alpha spectrum. But you can even see it in uh, absorption or basically by a process called Suyaev Soldovich, where you basically see the fact that some of the uh, um, um, cosmic microwave background photons get actually upscattered by um, Compton scattering by the reasonably hot gas in the filaments. And when you see, for example, this beautiful example of a filament in between two large uh, clusters observed by the Planck satellite, you see that filaments are real, also in terms of the gas, right? So they, the dark matter is still something that we cannot see, but we know it's there. We sort of um, have a, a reasonable understanding of where the galaxies are, but that's a discrete sampling, sparse sampling of the cosmic web. But now we can even see the gas distribution there. So, you know, the cosmic web, you find it in every probe that you can imagine. So, what about some of the properties of the cosmic web? Well, here is another uh, um, 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 depiction of the local cosmic web. This was made by um, uh, one of my PhD students. Um, he's an absolute master, um, even more in terms of um, the way he manages to depict and visualize things, Johan Hiding. And he actually has been using these initial conditions that I showed you from uh, Paco Kitara based on the Tumas survey and has been reconstructing the local cosmic web in dark matter and being identifying the filaments. And what you see here is a network. So it's a beautiful network. And at the same time, you see the complexity, right? So you see the filaments, you see the tenuous walls, and you see how the structure has been connecting up. Now, can we actually quantify this stuff? Can we quantify the, you know, the occurrence of filaments, the occurrence of walls, the way in which they are connected, the connectivity, um, the prevalence of the voids versus the high density regions, and all kinds of statistical interesting properties. And of course, to a certain extent we can, but most of the things we have not yet learned. Now here is the most rudimentary characteristics that you can think of. It's also based on the MMF nexus analysis of a, a simulation in the prevailing cosmological model, LCDM. And you see clearly that when you look at the pi diagram on the left, and you wonder where is most of the mass in the universe, you see that 50% of the mass in the universe is in filaments. The nodes, that's where the clusters are, is only 11%. They're not that uh, prominent as you may have thought before. Actually, there is more mass in voids, which are large, than there is in the nodes. But when you talk about the volume fraction, the story is completely different. Then you see in the second pi diagram that 77%, and that's a rather uh, representative number. Uh, other um, classifiers of the cosmic web often end up with similar numbers. 
most of the volume of the universe is in voids. Filaments, 6%. So although they are prominent in mass, they're not so, take up, don't take up so much of the, vol of the volume. That means they are higher density. Now the highest density regions are of course nodes, the clusters. They can have densities up to a thousand times the average of the universe. And when you look at the density distribution, you see the diagram on the right, then I should point you to some comparison. Look at the black solid line or uh, the, the dashed line. You see that's the voids. And look at the density along the horizontal line. It's logarithmic, it's not linear. So you see 10 zero, that's the mean density of the universe. You see voids almost by definition are always less dense than the average density of the universe. A few of them actually have a higher density. That's what I call the mountain lakes, right? So they are spoidy regions in higher density um, environment. The most interesting one is the blue line. The blue line is the filaments. And you see there that the density of the filaments runs from way below the average density of the universe. Those are the tenuous filaments in the voids up to almost a thousand. Those are the big arteries connecting up to clusters, right? So, if you say, well, you know, why do you take all this effort of getting a class, you know, a, a, a tool from medicine, medical research to classify the cosmic web? Here's the answer. If you would think you could do this by density, no way. Dense, you know, um, what density for filaments? Do you mean 100 times or 1,000 times or 10% of the average? You see, there's a large number of different uh, properties. So if you put everything together, you see here the main four main characteristics of the cosmic web. Anisotropic morphology, multi-scale structure, asymmetry between overdense filamentary node-like webwork and uh, voids, and the very important part, the complex spatial connectivity something that has is still very often ignored but which calls for a rather intricate topological description to be able to deal with this these are the characteristics of the cosmic web um so just to give you a little bit a taste of what miguel set into motion and why we think this is the very best tool around for uh, cosmic web classification. Um, this is a tool that not only identifies the filaments and the walls and the nodes and the voids, but also takes into account the scales. It basically introduces this concept of scale space, a fourth dimension that defines basically the scale at which a given filament or a wall um, uh, exists. So if you would, apply this to the observed distribution or the simulated distribution of mass, you get a map like this. This is a filament, it's an identification of filaments. And dependent on the color, you see that the blue colors is the tenuous filaments. The reddish ones are the big arteries connecting up to the nodes, right? That's the guys that along which basically stuff is channeling in into the nodes. So this tool allowed us to take into account these two very important properties, the properties of different morphology, morphology filter, but also the multi-scale. And most of the methods around at, still at the moment are not able to combine both of these aspects. So it's very important to be able to do that in a sophisticated way. Now, in addition to the first uh, versions of the MMF, we developed a range of um, 
subsequent elaborations of this, and we called it Nexus, where we actually took into account the agents that are the, the physical agents that do play a role in the physics of the cosmic web. It's not only the density, but you could say, well, these filaments and walls are basically the transport channels along which material gets transported in the universe. You go from the void-like regions into the walls, to the filaments, and finally end up in the nodes. So you should see the imprint in the velocity field. Or even further, you could say, you should see the imprint in the force field, in the forces and the tidal forces that are making these energotropic elements. So you could, you know, tune your MMF method, not only on the density field, but you could say, no, I'm looking at the velocity or the velocity, the shear of the velocity field or to the tidal forces. And all of these different aspects will then give you slightly, diff, you know, if you look, for example, at the velocity shear or the tidal forces, you get the big arteries. While if you look at the density field or the log density field, you get the smaller um, tendrils, the smaller filaments. So all of these aspects can be taken into account. And you can do the same for the walls, as you see here. The orange is the walls. And then you get the connection with the blue filaments. So let me um, um, see this. Now let me then proceed by how we understand how the structure is being formed, tuned into the cosmic web. Again, I'm borrowing here a picture, one of the pictures I think Miguel made for his thesis, which is a beautiful depiction of the evolution of structure in the universe, starting from the initial conditions on the left, the primordial universe with Gaussian uh, initial conditions that we have observed here, the W map satellite, Planck satellite. And then you go from the top left, gradually 13.8 billion years to the bottom left, and then you see how gradually the cosmic web is being molded by the gravitational forces in that are induced by the inhomogeneous mass distribution. So it's a beautiful image to show you where the cosmic web comes from. But of course, you want to model this and describe this in a quantitative way. Thereby, you also have to take into account that when you want to describe this, you cannot describe this on one scale, as I already told you. But when you, for example, want to talk about the voids, you have to take into account there is not one population of voids. There's a whole multi-scale distribution of voids. And it is a result of the fact that the gravitational evolution proceeds hierarchically. So you see this on the nice um, um, uh, image uh, movie on the left hand side, where you start at the redshift of two with a very with a population of very small voids, and you see that the voids congregate as if in a soap sub in larger and larger and larger voids, all due to gravity. On the right hand side, you see that the same happens for filaments. So you start with the small filaments. And they merge into larger and larger and larger filaments. And so the largest filaments that you see nowadays, hundreds of megaparsecs big, are basically the confluence of smaller voids. So how can you model this? Well, to this end, we go back to something that is already more than 50 years old. We go back to the Soviet Union, to Zeldovich the great Russian or Soviet uh, physicist, uh, Jakob Seldovich. In 1970, he wrote down a, a description for the gravitational evolution of mass elements. He was following the mass element evolution, each individual mass element, and he showed 
in this so-called Lagrangian um, formalism that to reasonable precision to the moment that a mass element would merge with a mass element coming from a other initial uh, location, we call that shell crossing, you can follow the orbit of these mass elements in a way that is almost, or at least to high accuracy, ingrained in the initial conditions. Basically, the only thing that you have to do is to know the gravitational potential that corresponds to the initial density field. It's a very simple description, and you see it at the top. If X is the location of the mass element, Q is its initial location. For the factor dt, read the time t. It's a so-called growth factor, and it only depends on gravitational time. And you read it as if it is a velocity. It is slightly more tricky, but it is very much related to the initial velocity of this mass element. And he showed that this velocity is actually the gradient of a velocity potential, phi, and that velocity potential is entirely one-on-one -on -one related to the gravitational potential. And it leads to a stunningly simple model of the evolution of mass in the universe. And here you see it. You see that already in 1970, although they didn't have the computers yet, the cosmic web was basically predicted. And so the Soviet scientists always believed in this. Now, of course, everything depends on these initial fluctuations, the nature of the initial fluctuations. That they didn't have in order, but the motion, the dynamics they had, but at the same time, if you look at that movie, you see that something queer happens towards the time that the structures start to form. At the moment you see the filaments and the walls form, you see they start to diffuse. That's where the Zeldovich approximation, as it is called, goes wrong. Why? Well, it's because Actually, when you look at it, when you rewrite the equation of motion of Seldovich, that, that thing over there, by means of the Bernoulli equation, you actually see, and you see it at the bottom right-hand side, that it is equivalent to the Euler equation. You know the Euler equation is the equation of motion for a fluid element. And you see on the right-hand side, is zero. So the Zeldovich approximation is basically the equation of motion for a force-free medium. But gravitational evolution is not force-free, right? As structures emerge, the gravitational force is changing, and that's why you see that Zeldovich starts to miss it out at the later times, right? So it predicts the cosmic web, but it can't predict, for example, its hierarchical evolution. You know, everything starts to diffuse out. You start on small scales and everything then has emerged, small filaments, and then things have gone. Towards the end of the Soviet Union, it were remarkably the Soviet scientists, again around Seldovich, but this was around the time that he passed away, who introduced a toy model where they actually said, well, if I actually put a force term on the right-hand side that models the gravitational evolution, that models the fact that as filaments emerge, I can sort of get the gravitational evolution and um, uh, the sticky nature, you do that by a, um, you know, by an uh, adhesive term over here. If you put that in, then I'm not bothered by this. And they call this the adhesion approximation. They use this because they didn't have the super 
duper computers that were being built in the West, and so they were being smart. And they showed that by making this term, they get an equation that is called Burgers equation. And it's one of the few fluid equations that you can fully solve numerically and almost analytically. Actually, you can write down the analytical solution, which you then can solve numerically. And it works beautiful. It allows you to not only see the buildup of structure in the universe, but see the hierarchical buildup. You see how the small voids merge into a larger and larger voids, how small filaments merge into larger and larger ones. Only towards later times, there is some artificiality getting in there. But overall, this addition approximation is showing both the morphological evolution of filaments and walls and the multiscale evolution. Right? Now, of course, everything is in the practice of how to do these calculations efficiently. And it was again my PhD student, Johan Hidding, who solved this in a beautiful, elegant way and showed that you can actually do this on the basis, basically solve the equations on the basis of so-called tessellations, Voronoi and Belloni tessellations. And it allowed him to basically infer, and I only make you look at the bottom line, to basically totally numerically follow in a highly efficient way the hierarchical buildup of the cosmic web. So you see how you start with small filaments on the left-hand side that merge into larger and larger structures on the right-hand side. The top line is basically the initial field of gravitational perturbations dissected by the so-called the lonely tessellations. I won't go into the details. So why do I want you to, to tell you this? Well, we use this to actually go, and this is in collaboration with Francisco Kitara, to investigate the structure of the cosmic web in the local universe and actually look at its evolution. How did we end up in the cosmic web that we see around us? So what we did is we used this Tumas survey sky map that was processed by Francisco Guitarra into this primordial density field. And subsequently, we, on the basis of this, obtained the initial conditions that allowed us to infer but to follow the dynamics with this adhesion prescription and model the local universe. And not only one, but you basically get a whole slew of possible configurations because the galaxies are only so many galaxies. So there are various reconstructions that fulfill the constraints put up by the observed galaxy distribution. Now, all of you probably, of at least the ones who, who have followed cosmology over the past uh, years, know about the, the Laparin geller hakra slice that was published in 1986, which is almost like the discovery of the cosmic web. Well, here at the top, you see the image. At the bottom, you see the reconstruction made by Johan with us at zero, zero. And you see that the implied dark matter distribution and the shade of green is basically the density or its surface density of the walls and the filaments in that region. And you see indeed the voids that you see in that observed galaxy distribution and the filaments. And you, know, you can even identify the voids. And on the right hand side, you see the accompanying velocities. So you see, you get a dynamical view. You see where the transport of matter in the local universe 
is leading us. Now, this is one reconstruction, but like I said, you can actually have a range of configurations that would all adhere to the, um, uh, the constraints put there by the observations. You can average them and then you get a mean reconstruction. So which filament, which wall you see coming back in each of these allowed reconstructions. That's the game that we play. So here you see a two maps of the dark matter distribution in the local universe along in two slices in opposite directions through the center of a box and we are at the center of the box. So this is the observed local cosmic web or at least the local web, the cosmic web implied by the observations. The red dots are the observed galaxies and you see how nice they actually do probe the implied structures. This is an average of 25 realizations and you see that you can actually identify voids in the local universe. By the way, the uh, a plane along the zero line in the horizontal direction is called the supergalactic plane. And when you see the cross, that's where we are. And you see in the left-hand side, a little bit to the left, you see Virgo. That's the Virgo cluster. And you see the flattened structure in the local universe. That's uh, basically um, the, the, uh, the, the local supercluster. So you do get a three-dimensional image of the local universe. You can study the dynamics, the flows in the local universe. And you see how Mars is moving out of the voids, right? So here is six realization, but we had 25 of them. And then we take the average and get basically one mean implied structure of the universe, the mean structure of the local universe and of the cosmic web. And we basically can do the same thing again um, of all kinds of structures. For example, the image that I showed you already, here is a nicer three-dimensional image of the Piscus Perseus region. You see this ridge here, that's the Piscus Perseus supercluster. It's a reconstruction, but the thing is real. As you see here, and this is the real observed one. Here you see the distribution, the density map of galaxies observed in, with 21 centimeter in the same direction. And, you know, have a look. It's really that structure. So how do we live in the local universe? Well, if I showed you this ridge, which you see here beautifully over there, and you wonder where it is, well, you see that the ridge is actually the boundary of a large wall, which is tenuous, much less dense. And here you see how you should see that. Home, that's where we are. The diamonds is the galaxies in the distribution. And you see that we are connected by a bridge here running vertically up to A262. A262 is the Perseus cluster the main cluster in the Perseus chain ridge supercluster. So you see that it's at the oversight of a large empty region, a large void. On the other side of the void is the Perseus supercluster. So this gives you a little bit the impression of the local universe in which we live. So I can do the same thing as what I started with in the initial conditions or in the uh, first talk. Rin, I'm, I'm sorry. Just as we agreed, um, just to remind you, we have been already uh, 50 minutes. Yeah, okay. So can I have five more minutes, uh, Miguel? Yes, of course, of course. Okay. So let me then take you along a CT scan, but this is not a computer simulation. This is the real world a reconstruction. So we walk here 
through the local universe in a sequence of slides and you see the opening up and closing of voids in the local universe. This is us, right? So I gave you now an impression of the local universe, told you about the gravitational forces uh, that have made this thing. So what can we say about the contributions of the various elements to the force forces in the overall uh, universe? So this is work that I have been doing with a student, Roy Kugel, which he has been doing over the past few years, in which we have actually made an inventory of how much of the force field is due to filaments? How much to walls? How much to voids? And I cannot go into all the detail, but I will, in these past last few minutes, give you an indication of who are the dominant agents in the local universe. And the message that we obtain from this systematic study built on the MMF nexus, by the way, where we identified filaments, etc., is that the main contributor to the forces in the universe are the filaments. Perhaps not surprising, because they represent most of the mass. The conventional cosmic web picture says that the clusters are the ones that are responsible for most of the tidal forces and strains that in the end produce the filaments in the walls. That turns out to be a bit more sophisticated than that. The clusters don't play that much of a role. They start playing a role, but in the early universe, it's the voids. And not only that, the voids, are in terms of the forces, the strength of the forces, perhaps not the strongest, they are only second strongest after the filaments, but they are much more organized. If you wonder where does the web-like pattern come from, then you see that the voids are the main agents for determining that. And let me conclude, therefore, with a few images. Um, I should here proceed to this thing, where a few results, where we dissected the contributions of the forces in terms of top left hand, the filaments, top right hand, the voids, top bottom right hand the nodes, and the other one the walls. Now, if you wonder at each location in your volume, where do I, and I feel a certain force, gravitational force, who is actually producing most of that force? You see here, that's force fraction, that indeed the filaments are the prime responsible, but the nodes are far less responsible than often thought. Actually, the orange, which is the voids, are much more prominent than the nodes. That's because they are much larger. They dominate a far larger region of space. So in terms of the magnitude of the forces, it's filaments number one, number two is the voids. Now, if we actually look at the tidal fields, it's an even more interesting story. So look at the top right-hand side. You see the contribution of the voids. Top left-hand side, you see the filaments. The filaments stand out more, but are less coherent than the pattern that you completely see in the voids. And indeed, when you make the inventory, and here you see the slide on the left-hand side, where we look, for example, in the filaments region, 
you see that indeed, when you are sitting in a filament, most of your tidal uh, influence is due to filaments. That's the purple. But when you are in the void, it's the void. And notice that in the filament, the voids are also very important. So voids, in the end, are far more important in the whole story than what you would have imagined beforehand, because they are empty, right? Or only 20% of the average. So I would like to conclude with a conclusion that I like very much starting emanating from the time I wrote my thesis, which was on voids. Voids indeed are the organizers of the cosmic web. Filaments are the dynamical agent. They are the force agent, but the voids organize the cosmic web. There's a lot more detail here to tell about this inventory, but I think this should be the take home message. And let me thank you again for your attention and give back the floor to Miguel. Well, thank you very much, Rin, for this very, very interesting talk. Fascinating to see all this work that you have been doing. Uh, so we, we have some questions, um, but, uh, Vladimir, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Very, very nice, very illustrative talk. Uh, very provocative in, in, in your conclusions. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first is more than a question, a comment. You said at the beginning that uh, there is a similarity between the cosmic wave and the circulatory systems, veins and arteries. Uh, I think uh, this is not too correct because the physical origins of both cases are very different, yeah? In the case of the cosmic wave, of course, as you mentioned, it is gravity, uh, the, the main, yeah, yeah. Uh, the gravity and the, the, the mass power spectrum, the initial conditions, yeah? But in the case of the circulatory system, I think is, I don't know, but it's completely different. Completely yeah? different. Yeah, I, so the, it's a little, dang, geometrically, pro, yeah, they, they are very nice, uh, the, the agreement well, is nice, I mean, yeah. I, I agree, Vladimir, but, uh -huh. that's, but that's the interesting thing. Um, the point is that, of course, they are widely different. The physics is completely different. It's gravity versus basically fluid dynamics. Wow. The most important difference is basically the dynamic range. When you look at the medical image, uh, you know, the brightness, so to say, of an artery is completely different from uh, you know the 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 uh, some of the uh, membranes and stuff like that. So if you look at the medical image, the practical implementation is really quite different. It's much easier, I would say, in medical imaging than in the cosmic distribution. Actually, it's one of the main. One of the riddles that was solved by Miguel is actually translating this to something that could deal with the much softer circumstances of the, uh, of the cosmic web. Now, in terms of morphology, actually one of the interesting things that very often we see in physical systems is that wildly different physical mechanisms and systems often have remarkably similar morphological resemblance, right? So different um, processes can always lead to similar structures. And in the, in, in the case of, of um, you know, web-like structures, networks, we see it coming back in enormous uh, range of systems. A few weeks ago, uh, Mark Nyring gave a, uh, a presentation at uh, a group meeting that we regularly have, where he actually was talking about moulds. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of mould is producing also web-like networks where you, of course, you see the differences, but you also see the remarkable similarities. 
Yeah. And it's actually one of the virtues. It's very nice, actually, because it gives us a handle to argue in grant proposals that our stuff is not only nice for studying the universe, but also of use in medicine and also of use in, I don't know, um, plants and botanics and stuff right. like that. Um, or in weather, right, where you see the same kind of phenomena. So, um, yes, you are right. They are different systems, but sometimes we also should recognize the similarities. Right. Thank you. And my second question is regarding the effects of the cosmic web uh, on the galaxy and halo properties, uh, uh, yeah. according to, to their uh, loci in, in the cosmic web. Yeah? For example, the halo mass function of the, or the galaxy stellar mass function, how change in between knots, walls, filaments, voids, or the concentrations, uh, spin parameters, so what do you, I think there is some discussion, yeah? Some people say that the effects of the cosmic web are small on the galaxy and halo properties. Other people claim that uh, there are large effects. So what yeah, would um, you say it, about that? Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, there's a lot of arguing about this. And I think it depends uh, on what you're looking at. If you say, if you argue, for example, that a lot of galaxy properties are actually completely dominated by the mass of the galaxy or the halo, then for apparently a large fraction, you are right, right? So you could say, well, you know, just depends on the mass of the halo. I would argue, yes, but the mass of the halo depends very much on the environment. You get completely different halos in voids than you get in the filaments or in the clusters. Is that due to the environment? Yeah, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? <laughs> but there are some other properties of galaxies that are almost certainly solely determined by their web-like environment. And actually, I passed it by because it's one of these um, force forces, um, force manifestations, where you really see that this is the story of the cosmic web influence on galaxies. And it has everything to do with the rotation and in particular the spin direction of galaxies. And here you see why the filaments and the walls are made by the tidal forces on large scales. We know from galaxy formation, the prevailing theory is that the rotation of galaxies is actually induced by tidal torques. It's torques working on a collapsing halo and galaxy. In the linear regime, yeah? Being torqued, being torqued, right? Hmm. Now, there you see a close link. And how close is the link? That actually, goes back to what I say is the main discovery of Miguel's thesis. Miguel, for the first time, showed it's not only the simple tidal talking. He actually was the first one to point out that when you look at the rotation of galaxies, in particular their spins in filaments, you find that the large galaxies tend to spin perpendicular on average. But the more you go to smaller galaxies, the more they are aligned along the filaments. This is basically the image of our 2007 paper. And I still remember at the time that we just got it out in time because after we put it, remember Miguel, after we put it on uh, AstroPH, we got a very worried uh, email from Cristiano Porciani and Avishai Dekel and said, shit, we just were publishing this result. <laughs> so they published it almost a few days later where they had find a similar thing. By now, this so-called spin flip is considered to be one of the main manifestations of web-like influence on the spinning of galaxies and therefore one of the main properties of galaxies. 
and by now, this is recent work by a, um, uh, a more recent PhD student, Punya Ganeshaya, in, together with Marius Cotin and um, Elmo Temple, we showed that actually, in terms of influence, it turns out it very much depends on the filament in which these halos are embedded. The thick filaments imply a different behavior than the thinner ones. So here you may argue it doesn't matter, but this one really is one where it's outstanding. And given that the morphology of galaxies turns out to be very much dependent on the rotation of galaxies, I would argue that here we have an effect that you can ascribe almost solely to the web-like environment. Does that answer your question, Vladimir? Yes, yes, th thank you very much. Very good uh, answers. Thank you, Orion. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, Octavio, please. And, and, um, okay. Uh, let's, let's try to keep uh, this short because sure. I guess some people also have the meetings. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I noticed in the visualizations that voids have inner voids and filaments and uh, another structure. The sizes, distribution of sizes and abundance of, of those sub voids and sub filaments depend uh, mostly on initial conditions or also maybe on the dark matter properties. Have you studied that? Um, yes, it, um, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, so it, it depends on both. It depends basically on the, 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 the spectrum of initial fluctuations. So how much, you know, the amplitudes on small scale fluctuations versus large scale fluctuations. Then, of course, in addition, it depends on what's the fraction of dark matter uh, versus baryonic matter, etc. That's another effect that comes in. At the moment, actually, um, um, you know, we we I I I started looking into this systematically together with Ravi Shet in um, in two thousand four, and we made we basically inferred on the basis of this what you would expect for a given uh, power spectrum in the, of initial fluctuations for the void size distribution. And it turns out that, and, and this is work by a, a range of groups at the moment, uh, the group of uh, Alice Pisani and Ben Wandelt is very active in this. They are actually pursuing this uh, void distribution now um, as a constraint on uh, various cosmological parameters. And they want to uh, uh, use this in large upcoming surveys like Euclid and the Vera Rubin Observatory and et cetera. So it turns out that the void size distribution that you see here, uh, how many small voids, large voids and et cetera, is one of the strongest cosmological constraints that one actually may infer from the distribution of galaxies. It remains to be seen, by the way, whether this is really true in reality, but you know, there is now a range of studies that are indicating that it is indeed very interesting. Do you think it's sensitive to the, maybe a signature of non-Gaussianity of initial conditions? Yes, absolutely. That, that is, you know, very, very clear. And the reason is obvious. Um, the non-Gaussianity, if you would have even the smallest deviation on the uh, low density side, it would mean that you would have, uh, for example, if the amplitude of the, on the low density side is larger than what you expect from a Gaussian distribution, then you would suddenly have far more uh, strong voids than what you would expect from Gaussian emission conditions. So that actually is one of the strongest manifestations that you could get. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you, Octavio. And uh, uh, Mark, the last question, please. Right. So um, uh, first, just a, a quick comment on 
um, Vladimir's question about the similarity to the um, to the circulatory system. Um, I, I just my opinion is that well, even though the physical processes are of course very different, um, uh, a unifying theme at least for the cir circulatory system in this is that there's a transport of something from um, well in the circ circulatory system um, you're trying to transport uh, nutrients around in a sort of uniform medium, whereas here we're, the universe is transporting matter from uniform, initially uniform um, system into galaxies. Um, so that I think that's my that's my opinion of why why there's that sim similarity and and it ends up being kind of similar. Um, I also have a short question. Um, you, Rene, you, you already sort of addressed it a little bit, but um, uh yeah the the work of, about the um where the forces and tidal fields come from is really interesting um uh and you mentioned the spin um uh have you so i guess well how directly does the measurement of the contribution of different web elements to tidal to the tidal field address where the spin um what cosmic web elements um, uh, are most important for the spins of hal of halos? Okay, or... it's a very good question, uh, Mark. Um, Roy, who did this for his master thesis, by the way, not his PhD thesis, um, started looking into this. But the, of course, you know, uh, the spin being basically the cross product um of um, um uh, the cross product um makes it far more difficult um to uh, execute and so uh, the results that we got were um not good enough yet to make any conclusive uh, statements about this the the analysis we, we didn't trust it, so we, we set it aside for the moment. But it is something that we certainly want to do. But I have to admit that I have to say that at the moment, I cannot say anything uh, substantial about it, except that given that both in terms of the force field and the tidal field, the filaments are the dominant actor, it would be surprising if they are not the main contributor to the spin. But it's more an inference than that it is a firm statement of the analysis. I'm so I'm I'm sorry I have to uh, okay. uh, refrain <laughs> from a conclusive answer on this. Yeah, okay. The very last question now, Michael, please. Uh, Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I was really intrigued by the questions of dynamics. And if we think back several decades to the radial velocity studies, surveys, um, there was an issue of a great attractor um, that was very conveniently hidden behind the plane of the Milky Way. Um, is that now, would that be understood to be partly myth? Um, and just a result. No, 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 no. It's 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 a very good question, by the way, and it's not a myth at all. But it's not as outstanding as it was uh, at first uh, thing. But here you see basically the state of the art at the moment. This is the cosmic flows survey led by Brent Tully and Hélène Courtois, and together with Yehuda Hoffman they, for the first time, managed to get so many peculiar velocities in the local universe that they could basically push their reconstruction to the so-called quasi-linear stage. That is, it's no longer only linear, but it goes a little bit further. That enabled them to basically get information on the so-called shearing the shear in the velocity flows. And so they have a far better um, inventory of the force field in the local universe. 
And when you look at this, they have beautiful movies on the web of the motions in the local cosmic web. And here I show you some of these images. So this sausage thing is basically in red, you see the clusters. In, in white, you see the, the voids and the, the gray is basically the filaments. And what the uh, great attractor uh, turns out to be is a major concentration um, in the uh, direction, what was it again? It, it, it is point, it, it's just further away towards the um, uh, Shapley concentration, halfway in between Shapley concentration and Virgo, you see a large concentration. And that's basically what we call the great attractor. It's less impressive than it was at the end of the 80s when the region probed was too small to be any firm. It now falls more into place, but it has not disappeared. It's still there. It's a major force. And yeah, I mean, you don't see it that easily in optical observations, but in reconstructions like this, you see it plays a large role in the force inventory of the local universe. Very soon there will be, this is all based on the so-called Cosmic Flows 3. Very soon they are going to publish Cosmic Flows 4, in which they will have four times more peculiar velocities. And um, one of the interesting claims, and this is very, very uh, um, new, not with cosmic flows, but from cosmic flows three and the reconstruction, they had the impression that there is a large void pushing just outside of the volume that is being probed by cosmic flows. They published this, but never substantiated it. They somehow the analysis was not conclusive. A few days ago, the, uh, a group called Sabi, uh, who published a constrained simulation of the local universe um, called Sibelius Dark. It's one of the largest simulations ever done. It's also based on two mass. So what I described to you, but it's done in an embody simulation. It was done led by Jens Jasje, Guillaume Laveau, Carlos Frank is involved, and etc. And they, in their reconstruction, find that indeed there must be a large underdensity pushing the local volume. So it's not only the great attractor that seems to be a dominant contributor to the forces in our local universe, there is also a big repulsor, and we can't see it, but it's there. There's two independent studies now that seems to indicate this. So I hope that sort of addresses your question. And, and it, it's just because I just saw the press <laughs> announcement of this Sabilius Dark. And uh, it, it's quite interesting to see that indeed there is a repulsor now not only an attractor. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And let's thank uh, Rin again for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you, Rin. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, um, thank you for your attention. And uh, well, thank you, was really. Oh, I would like to mention before uh, we we say goodbye that there is a collaboration between the University of Groningen and NAM, oh, yes. and yeah. uh, this is a very good opportunity, especially for students to do part of their PhD in the Netherlands and part here at UNAM. So if you want to know more, there are, there are several people involved. Rin is one of them. I'm also interested in this collaboration. Yes. Uh, please. So Miguel and I hope to, to use this collaboration for you know, continuing our interest in the cosmic web. Well, thank you again, Rin. Thank you, okay. everybody. See you next week. And some of us are going to say, because we have a machine learning club starting now. <laughs> Okay, so well, see you have a nice day. For us, it's the... good evening. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye Luke. See you. See you. Bye bye.
Hola a todos. Este, se alargó un poquito el, 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 el coloquio, pero aquí estamos. A ver, me imagino que ahorita somos todos los que somos, ¿verdad? No creo que, no, no creo que haya necesidad de esperar uh, por más participantes que se, que se, que se conecten. 